Hello to everybody. I am Caroline Bowman, and I am fortunate to have the job of director of Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. And for those of you in the way back row, come closer. Let's make this an intimate conversation. There's not that many of us, and I promise we're not scary. We are, though, two things. We're a little tired because we are in day five of a new experiment at Cooper Hewitt, the lab, design access. And I see a lot of familiar faces and some new faces. So I am going to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the why behind today and behind what we have planned for the future. And I want to send a huge congratulations to the 20-some students who were chosen to be showcased up here in the Barbara and Morton Mandel Design Gallery. This is a terrific opportunity, and we had the opening of our terrific show, Access Plus Ability, last night. And many, many people and visitors were meandering up here and admiring your ideas. So congratulations, congratulations, and I'm looking forward to hearing the conversations about the different concepts today. So accessibility and inclusivity. We need to be leaders in this conversation at Cooper Hewitt. We are America's only design museum. Our purpose in life is to inspire and educate and empower people through design. But we've got to do that for everybody. We've made some really important steps towards inclusivity in the last few years, including digitizing our entire collection of 210,000 objects. I think most of you have delved into the collection online. If you haven't, I encourage you to. We also came up with an interactive tool that is known in a friendly manner as the pen. If you haven't used it, please do experiment. The idea is that America's design collection is your design collection. So build your own design collection with the pen. We also give access and welcome visitors at 8 AM to our beautiful garden. The idea is you don't have to be a donor, you don't have to be a member, you don't have to be anyone special. We want everybody to come to Cooper Hewitt and experience the museum. Yesterday's symposium was a series of scintillating conversations around the topic. It is on our YouTube channel, so if you weren't here, please be sure to, to experience that. And on that note, I know we have a lot of generation next, if not a majority of generation next in this room. So please do share this on social media. We're proud of this effort, and we have five more days of our lab, but you can help us make this conversation larger, expand the circle of Cooper Hewitt, and expand the circle of conversation around this really important topic. So thank you so much. I don't only want to see you today, I want to see you often at Cooper Hewitt and welcome you back on a regular basis. So thank you so much and thank you to our expert panelists and let's have a great afternoon. Ruki, I think you're up. Hi everyone, I'm Ruki Ravikumar. I'm the Director of Education here. For those of you who have joined us, after, coming back after this morning, welcome back again. And I want to just, before we get started on all the feedback and presentations, this is a huge honor for those of you who have your work up here, and congratulations. I have a few notes just to get everyone acquainted with the place and oriented with the program. The restrooms and water fountains are located on the ground floor. Assistive li listening devices, T-coil loops, and audio descriptions are available for this event. If you need any assistance at all, please see one of us. Um, and our staff are wearing uh, buttons that say Cooper Hewitt on them. We, as Caroline said, we'd love for you to share your experiences with us on social media. Um, the hashtags are hashtag CHLab and hashtag design access. The event is being live streamed, so for those of you who um, cannot be here, or if you'd like to let others know about this, they can look at this at cooperhewitt.org slash live. So the sequence that we'll be following is that we have grouped the projects, and so we'll, we'll have the students present, and so the first group, we have six projects. After they present, we have four panelists, and they will offer their feedback. 
um, to those students. With that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Margaret Price. She's the principal design strategist at Microsoft. Margaret focuses on the intersection of technology, human rights, and design inspiration. Currently helping to create, evolve, and scale the inclusive design practice at Microsoft. Her background is in philosophy, studying human nature and monitoring the cultural landscape to identify areas for creative and strategic growth. She recently collaborated with a series of industry experts to create a documentary about inclusive design and the importance of understanding, designing for, and embracing human diversity. Her strategy is featured in the Inclusive Design Toolkit, which was recently awarded by IXDA and nominated as a Fast Company World Changing Idea. Welcome, Margaret. We also have with us today Elise Roy. She's an inclusive design strategist and founder of Elise Roy & Associates. She helps companies analyze products, services, and programs from the vantage point of people with disabilities. Her solutions utilize the belief that the unique experiences of people with disabilities help us uncover hidden needs, wherein lie the most profound solutions for everyone as well as her work as a lawyer, marketing manager, and product designer. Elise is, Elise is based in Washington, DC. Then we have Kara Gwynn. She's the designer of the R82 scallop, which is featured in the Access Plus Ability show downstairs. R82 is a Denmark-based company that produces technical aids and appliances for children and young people with disabilities. While completing her MA degree, Kara entered into a partnership with R82 to develop the scallop further and prepare the product for global launch. She is based in Denmark. And finally, not last but not the least, we have Wale Sabri, who is the Digital Accessibility Coordinator for the New York City Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. He was born in Egypt and raised in New York City. He was one-sided and is now blind. His field of expertise includes transitioning in all facets of life. As the Digital Accessibility Coordinator, Wale makes sure that the city of New York's digital products can be accessed by all. Please give them a round of applause and a warm welcome. <laughs> to the students here, we'll get you started. If you could please introduce yourself and the school that you're coming from before you begin your presentation, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone hear me? <laughs> Hi, I'm Allison. I graduated from Pratt Institute last year, and here I'm super happy to share with you my new passion, design for the new aging. A little bit about me. I'm, my name is Tian Han Zhang. I was born and raised in China, and then graduated from Pratt last year. And LIFT is a project I was done last year as one of my senior thesis project. I want to start by a quote from David Boy. Aging is an extraordinary process where you should become the person you always want to uh, wanted or should have been. And I hope everyone should age well. And that's a process I'm also working towards. And there's a lot of tools or a lot of product design for senior citizens. There are some of them like wheelchairs or cans or walkers. They're designed as a tool to assist your life. But when I design Lyft, I want Lyft to enhance the aging experience. Um, here I want to introduce Eric Stoberg. Uh, she is one of the users I interviewed and uh, connect with last year. She has red hair and she's on a walker with a beautiful flower t-shirt. 
Um, through uh, two, three months with her, um, I noticed a lot of uh, mobility difficulties she has and a lot of opportunities I can design towards. Here's a picture of me playing with a um, antique ruler with her. Apparently we have the similar rulers from different times. And there's a saying from her I really remember, which is, flower makes a home, how, uh, make a house home. And I think that's super important when I try to see which position or which direction I should design for her. And I see a lot of windows. And um, for me, I think windows is a accessibility for people to connect the inter and outer world. And for Erica, it's a little bit challenging because she has uh, physical difficulties. So it's really hard for her to lift double hinge windows and a lot of them will make her feel sad and disconnected with people. So that's the directions I direct to want to design with. And here comes the lift. It comes with five parts, remotes and window lifters. It's a home accessibility product that helps senior citizens to open and close double hinge windows. It connects with existing windows. And here you can see how it connects open and close your windows. It comes with portable remotes, intuitive to use, and also a wall-mounted remote, which you can open the window by swiping up. Ultimately, I believe having accessibility to smell the fresh air and hear surrounding environments is essential for human life, so I really want to work towards that. Thank you. Got my own cable. Yeah. Ah, this one. Hi, my name is Juliet uh, van Haren, and I'm a graduate student at Parsons. I would like to present to you my project Memento. Uh, this project started with a question, how do you relive memories? As a person with sight, I often take photos of moments that are important to me. And after talking to people who are blind, I realized that there's not much on the market um, to collect tactile memories. That's how I started with the goal to give people who are blind a tool to collect uh, store and relive memories through touch. The concept is to go from a visual representation to a tactile representation. Input would be gotten from a 3D camera, this will be processed and output would be touchable. At the market there are already embossing machines, but unfortunately these are quite expensive, big and too hard to uh, use it yourself. The system I propose is um, to extract an object from a visual scene taken by a 3D camera, which will be converted into a bas relief. I looked at several uh, research projects by Stanford and Cornell University to create moving displays, and eventually I chose to go for a system that uses uh, rods that can vertically move up and down. So I will be wor I was working with uh, small and fairly cheap motors that can have a rod that can move up and down. And I wanted to have a lot of them, so um, it would look like a very big square uh, brill grid. 
Um, so eventually I chose to go for a grid that is square and has a lot of those motors that go up and down. And of course it would be really nice if, the, if I could have a very high resolution, but due to the size of the motors, I was limited in my Braille pixel to inch ratio. During the process, I went from abstract sketches, form research, um, material research and production, and I've eventually made three prototypes that I would like to develop further. One is a tablet that is square, has a silicone membrane covered over the rods that move up and down, and have buttons on both sides in order to uh, let both left-handed users and right-handed users be able to use it. Another prototype we made is a desktop version, which is larger than a tablet version and has rounded corners in order to avoid injuries. And the last is a bracelet, which you can wear on your arm. It's a curved version of the Braille grid, and it gives a more intimate way of going back through memories. So how does it work? You simply turn on the device on the top side, and you touch the scene while the 3D camera is giving the input, and you can press on the button on the side in case you want to collect the tactile memory. If you want to go flip through memories that have already passed years ago, this is simply done by voice activation. Uh, in th these are some steps that are in, in the pipeline, and I would like to fo focus on that uh, further in the future. Um, Hello, my name is Gregory. I'm from Virginia Tech, and I represent the Chivo team. So in this project, what we really wanted to focus on were isolated, depressed seniors. And through our research, we found that isolated, depressed seniors can become increasingly isolated. They become frustrated and with complex daily tasks. They struggle to maintain a healthy diet, and overall, they just lose interest in things on a day-to-day -day basis. So we wanted to ask ourselves this overarching question while we were going through this project, and that was, how can we reduce depressive symptoms for seniors through home cooking? And that's when we came up with the Chibo, a personal cooking aid which helps senior citizens run through recipes in a way that engages them through learning and a way that also facilitates a reward system to make them feel accomplished throughout the day. So this is how it works. You approach the Chibo, the system that I just provided, a white computer, computational system, and you touch the bezel to activate it. Once you get close, you say a series of qualifier words, which can either be ingredients or certain recipes that you want to enact throughout the cooking process. Once you have selected which recipe or what you want to cook with, a creative matrix is prompted on the screen. Once you select the individual recipe that you would like, once you select the individual recipe that you would like, the screen prompts, you, prompts a video that comes up with built-in display of what exactly the ingredients are being used and a timer that helps you run along through the recipe. And now a short video. This design can fit in any home environment a lot of the design for the specific form was borrowed from a lot of iconic mid-century modern forms that is familiar to the user and can fit in many environments.
So as you can see, the senior is using the Chivo and it's prompting him what recipes are currently occurring. In. The removable Bluetooth speaker enables him to move around the kitchen while still being able to hear what is going on during the video. And this is Chibo. Hi, my name is Celine Lee. I'm a junior at Pratt Institute studying industrial design. Um, my pro the project that I designed was Ligado, which is an ankle brace designed for athletes. Um, I've been playing sports competitively almost my whole life, um, especially soccer and basketball. Four years ago, during one of my games, um, my ankle rolled um, inwards, and um, I had ankle inversion sprain which resulted in a torn ACL and my torn ATFL, which is the ligaments in my knee as well as the ligament in my ankle. And so since then, I've had two back-to-back -back surgeries. Um, on the screen is a photo of me, me and my surgeon, and this is the aftermath of the surgery. And so since then, even now, my left knee is numb, and I can feel it two to three times a week. And there's a three-inch scar that will be there forever. And so from this, I talked to my friend who worked at Nike, um, and he said that he talked to the footwear designers there in high top, low top shoes, and why the rate of injury is still so high. Um, and so the answer he got was that the human biological structure is not made for us to be under intensive sport um, activities and to, um, and because we're, our biological system is not built to undergo extreme sports. So from there, I thought of looking not just at the human biological structure, but looking into animals through biomimicry and how their, through predatory evolution, their limbs are strong enough to uphold their body weight while they're running and doing agile activities. And I realized that hoofed animals with ungulates actually mimic our footwear, which is a one, sur one surface platform that allows us to run at a faster rate. From there, I looked at the trigger points that, is, um, that we're most prone to under injury, and I designed an exoskeleton technology that you can insert into athletic footwear for athletes to perform at the highest level without comprom compromising safety. Um, I looked at, I 3D scanned a leg, and I built a um, support system around the ankle. And so on the screen is Rigare, the ankle brace. Um, there's a blue, it looks like a sock, and it's made of neoprene, which um, is sh shock absorption. And there are, there's a plate on the outside, a flat plate that mimics your fibula, and that um, helps, your, helps support your ankle from inverting, inverting, and a plate on the inside that helps your ankle from everting. And so how you would use it is before a game, you would bend your ankle inwards until to the point that it starts hurting a little, you'll lock it in and you'll bend your ankle outward until it starts hurting. And so your ankle is not physically not able to go past that angle of operation. So you can't break your ankle. And that would help you um, in your knee injury as well. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wenny. I'm from Parsons School of Design. So introducing my project, Brew. So New York City is promoting bicycling as an alternative form of transportation and has a cool and hardcore cycling culture. So on the image, there are a group of teenagers riding the bikes. And sorry, bike hacking culture and bike builders community also in, there, uh, in Brooklyn and in the image, there is a bike builder riding on a uh, hacking tall bike. Um, but however, given the availability of inexpensive scooters, parents are less likely to purchase a bike for their children. Furthermore, the trendiness doesn't appear in the bicycling, uh, in the bicycling learning experience. So how can I improve the accessibility and the experience of children bicycling learning in New York City? Introducing Brew, a balanced bike made of recycled handlebars. It is customizable and variable for local bike fabricators to create frames in unique shapes. So after experimenting with all kinds of handlebars, I found that the most common riser bars could work as a, a frame for the bike and the flat bar could work for the front fork. And the most crucial part is actually the head tube of this bike. It functions as a connector that clamps all the parts together in the right angle and turning well. So the head tube also works as a jig that helps bike builders to weld the bike easily. So, um, so it's not only a bike, it's also part of a, a community bike sharing system and the city's bike recycling system. So here I have a short video showing the distributing system of Brew. Here's all the pictures of new, the bikes and bike riders in New York City. So the set, step one is recycle all the handlebars from recycle a bicycle in Dumbo. There are tons of handlebars. And then is find a local metal fabricator to make the, sorry, to, to make the uh, connector by welding uh, many tubes together. And then it's connected handlebars by a local bicycle builder using the connector uh, to clamp all the uh, cutted handlebars together to form the bike's frame. And then it's to put the bike back to the recycled bicycle, which is a store located in Dumbo. And I accidentally put my bike there, and this kid thought it's for rental or for sale, so he just ride on it. And then I took my bike back uh, to a park, asked for a, a kid who was on a scooter to see if he could actually try to, sorry, if he could actually try my bike. Yeah. And he's doing quite well. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> sorry about the connecting issue. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm Carolyn from Carnegie Mellon University. So who are you? A brother, a teacher, an uh, Asian American woman? I'm sure whoever you are, there are many stereotypes associated to your identities. Stereotypes allow people to create, perceive you in a certain way and have expectations about how you may behave in certain situations. And my project focused on stereotypes in an academic setting. The stereotype that women are worse than men at math, the stereotype that black and Latino students perform poorly in school. So what's so bad about stereotypes? Well, imagine this. Um, you're taking a test at, at school, and how are you feeling? Personally, I'd be a little nervous. I'd be wondering, did I study enough? What happens if I bomb this test? 
So everyone has this test anxiety that is natural and common to everyone. However, for people in stereotyped groups, they have this extra added stress because of the negative stereotypes. They may be concerned that if I perform poorly on this test, then maybe this means that I will confirm the stereotype and that whoever is evaluating me will think that poorly of me and my group. So how do we... Um, so this phenomenon is called stereotype threat because of the stress that causes them to underperform. Um, so to study more about how to create a more inclusive learning environment uh, by reducing and mitigating the effects of stereotype threat, I decided to do unstructured interviews with a couple of my net friends and learn that people do experience this thing called stereotype threat and some have even um, suggested that they were able to get over stereotype threat by talking to the mentors and having um, role models in their lives. And this, these, responses, these responses are in line with current research in psychology where interventions have shown that exposing people to more minority, more minority role models and um, making people aware of stereotype threat has able to reduce this effect. So what I came up with was Lifted Pencils, which is a hypothetical uh, nonprofit brand of school supplies that features minority role models on the packaging to expose students to a diverse set of role models and uh, know that th this refutes those stereotypes directly. Additionally, there is uh, information about stereotype threat so that people can be aware of stereotype threat and be able to attribute this anxiety that they feel when taking tests and set that aside so that they can focus on just taking the exam and doing well. And additionally, the pencils in the, pack, in the packs have a small logo on it so that they can be reminded of, this, of the things that they have learned through these interventions, while, whether they're taking a test or whether they're in lecture, taking notes, or studying for something. So hopefully through this design, people will be able to um, worry less about confirming a negative stereotype about their group and focus on um, being able to reach their maximum potential in school. So I have a question for the creator of the Cibo. Cibo, sorry, my mistake. So you, you talked about um, designing this for senior citizens to help them uh, help with the cooking process and all that. Have you considered the use um, of other users, such as I was, I was thinking while you were, were presenting that it would be a great product for um, adults on the spectrum, so learning, diff or learning difficulties, stuff like that? Had you considered other users other than the senior citizens? I think in, I think in this initial um, ideation of this project, we were really focusing on one single problem, and we wanted to really hone down on that really hard. Um, a lot of our user research found that these people just wanted something that facilitated goals for them, mm -hmm. and something that they felt was going to be educational. Um, and the great thing about cooking is that it's universal. So many different groups can interact and engage themselves and feel a part of a community. Um, but in terms of moving forward, I'm sure there are many other applications that this device can accomplish, for sure. I think it's a really great product, and I think there's definitely a bigger scope than just the one target group for senior citizens. And I think if you looked really into the, there's a lot of other, um, uh, for cooking for adults with learning disabilities and on the spectrum, there's lots of devices that are targeted towards them to help them with that process. And I think that could be something that you could look into and focus a bit more on those kind of areas as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your feedback. Yeah, it's a great project.
I'm also wondering um, what you did in terms of people who might have hearing loss. Um, I can't, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly how you set up the entire information architecture and the display, and I'm curious how uh, somebody with hearing loss might be able to use your product. Did you say with hearing loss? Hearing loss. Yes, okay. So the display that we designed, we kind of combated it in two different ways. So in terms of visuals, we wanted the display to be very large and very easy to read with a clear hierarchy on the screen. And the whole important thing with the video on view video function was that they were able to see as the recipe was being cooked what they were preparing. And then on top of that, with the built-in timer and with the on cue ingredients and timing, um, I think that was a big part of it visually. Um, when it comes to the hearing aspect of it, um, the removable Bluetooth speaker allows the user to go around to different spaces in the kitchen in case they don't want to be right next to that um, main console. Um, and it allows them to be more mobile. But hearing loss um, and that specific issue, I think that can be combated visually um, unless there was another accessibility setting that we were to incorporate. Um, on top of that, actually, I, and sorry if I missed it during your presentation, is there some kind of, a lot of seniors have vision loss as well, so is there any sort of accessibility features? I know you said, you know, it's, it's a large screen and there's a lot of visuals going on that will help people with low vision, but what about some that maybe are blind? Is there some kind of um, verbal output or... Um, you know, tactile buttons, any tactile markings, any braille, have you thought of anything like that? Yes, um, well, tactility in question, um, one of the big things with the forum was we didn't want the user to just approach a screen. We wanted something that they were gonna be able to engage and interact with, something they could actually feel. So a big part of that was the rotating bezel, which was another mechanism to control what was on the screen. And then if you couldn't see, um, the voice activation features on the console were also very um, crucial for the product to be so strong. A lot of what we found in the user research was the elderly wanted something that talked back to them. And it could have been a question of accessibility, but I think it was also a question of having something that interacted with them on a different sense. And I think that was a big part of it as well. So I, would, I would highly recommend maybe that a feature that could be turned off for those who might find it annoying, but as you use the, um, you know, the, the bezel to navigate, to get verbal output for anything, you know, the, the item that is in focus, um, I could see that helping out a lot of folks. So. Thank you. Also, one more thing while we're focused on you. So I can tell watching, especially the video, your thoughtfulness in the software and in the hardware. Thinking from the lens of scale, I'm wondering if you've thought about making this an app, standalone app, for a tablet, knowing that it loses some functionality, like the timer, like the tactile nature of the timer and things like that. But have you thought about the software, given that you have voice and touch input, on what that might look like on like a really cheap tablet device to make it accessible for those who might not be able to afford the hardware? In our initial stages, we definitely considered an app, but I think a big part of it was just the mere approach to the object. I think a lot of the senior citizens that we interviewed, we actually went to an elderly home and did research with them side by side. So they were like pretty much a six designer in our five person group. And they told us that, you know, just engaging with a flat screen, something, it's very cold, a little harsh. Um, so we wanted something to be more friendly, more inviting. And for sure, in the future, if they wanted to just have a tablet and the app interface along with that, they sure can. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. I had uh, maybe some feedback for the, the camera one. I, don't, I forgot what it was called. Um, so you, you mentioned, um, it's the tactile camera, I guess. Um, you mentioned that to uh, browse through photos you've already taken, tactile photos, you use voice commands. Um, 
And I, I'm suggest my suggestion to you is very similar to what I just said before, which is um, have some more buttons on there. Uh, people like buttons. Um, and allow users to, to be able to control it without their voice as well. You know, being able to control something with your voice is great, but it shouldn't be the main um, method for navigating and finding photos. Um, so thinking about your product, since it, is, since it does produce something tactile, uh, one of the outputs could be Braille, right? Um, so if this, um, you, I, I'll, let's say I took a photo, um, there should be some method for me to label that photo. And then uh, when that photo is up, uh, that label should also be up so I know what photo this is. Um, so just some suggestions out here. Yes, thank you. I was definitely thinking of um, creating some, some kind of photo album button, buttons so that you could perhaps even add on buttons on the side in case you are creating more photo albums. But uh, yes, this is definitely something I, I have to work on more, on the, the infrastructure of the photo albums. And it would be cool maybe like very, very further on if maybe this could connect to smart device and somehow um, interpret the photos on my smart device and so that I can feel them in a tactile way as well. Yeah, I um, have a lot of plans and I would love to talk to you later if, in case you would like to be one of my uh, test users. Sounds great. Back for a stereotype threat. So, I love lifted pencil. I have a suggestion or qu also question if you've considered expanding. So it seems like your target audience are primarily people who experience stereotypes themselves. And I would encourage you to expand targeting toward people who stereotype, knowing the larger cultural tension that you're pushing up against to encourage all people to check their own bias and understand when they're putting people or typecasting people into stereotypes. So you can take this in a number of ways, thinking about creating the awareness and sharing these beautiful stories that you've already curated with different lenses for people who, um, all of us, have bias. So deconstructing what that looks like in the context of your stories and also targeting your exact audience as well. Have you thought about that? Yeah, I was hoping that in this hypothetical brand that it's not just like for people who experience stereotypes, but also like expose like everyone in general that this is something that exists and to be like more self-aware about like that these are things that people are experiencing that you may not be experiencing. Yeah. Love it. Thank you. I have a question for um, is there a difference for a blind person to kind of feel a curved surface, like try and read it, a picture on a curved surface versus a flat surface. Mm -hmm. Did you look into that? Yeah, so for the curved one, I wanted to work with a higher resolution so I could actually um, have an image on a small part that's not curved. Um, so yeah, I, I work with people from the Braille library here in New York, but I would like to test that further in order to see how curved it can be. Uh, that the object recognition would not go away. And how detailed are you imagining? Um, so at the moment I created grids of uh, 32 by 32 with staggered holes, um, simply because the size of the solenoid, the motor that moves up and down, is at the moment too big. But in the future I really hope that I can create smaller rods and then I would like to have the finest resolution as possible. Great, thank you. I just want to make sure, you did, are you in touch with the uh, Andrew Heiskell Library? Is that what you mentioned? Yeah. Okay, great. Cool. With uh, Delancey, maybe you know her. Chancy? Delan yeah, Chancy, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I have a question for the lifted pencils. Um, I think it's a great message that you've got, and I was just, you talked a bit about um, uh, talking to your, your friends, so your peers. And I was just wondering, have you thought about getting into sort of younger generations, so preschools, you know, starting at a young age, I guess they're more inclined to be using pen to paper, and as you get older, you sort of move on to tech. 
and you're sitting in class with your laptops and stuff like that. So sort of targeting right from the younger age. So when you actually reach in your, your teens, your 20s, when you're in uh, university, hopefully your message has then got in and then, yeah, helping out. I just wonder if you thought about sort of targeting younger. Yeah, I did consider like the different age groups and like depending on the age group, like how would the design have to change? And also taking into consideration like when people start to learn and realize about stereotypes. Because I feel like, um, I mean, eventually everyone will learn about stereotypes because it's a natural part of our society. They're going to find out anyways. So yeah, that's an interesting idea to see if like starting at a younger age will help build more. Yeah, yeah I think it's definitely something that you should look into. I mean. It, we're in this day and age where we're, we're talking a lot about gender and uh, you know gender stereotypes in in toys as children play, and then you know, these stereotypes come into play at a young age when we might not re be realizing that we're we're actually stereotyping. So I think to get those messages across early on is really important. I think it's yeah a great great tool that you have, and get it in there at a young age. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question for the um, the, product, the first one, the, the window lift. Um, I saw that there's two ways to control it, right? There's the touch sensor and then there's the remote. Mm -hmm. um, have you considered, um, and maybe I missed it during your presentation, I'm, I'm sorry if I did, have you considered uh, some kind of connectivity with your smart devices so that you know you can market it to a larger audience? Uh, yes, so the two remote I have, one is uh, more, I guess, easy to use if you're not familiar with technology, the other one is like more tactile feelings. So in the future, I was hoping if that can connect to voice control. I'm not sure if you always like voice around, but uh, you can always connect to the voice control and then ask Siri or ask Google to open or close the window, connect to the remote. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately, um, you know, it's good to hit the folks who aren't um, technologically savvy and aren't going to have smart devices, but it's also good to um, think about smart homes and connectivity because, you know, that's what we're moving towards. Every, you know, people want to be able to control all of the little gadgets and items in one place, right? So yeah. just something to... Cool. Thank you. For the ankle brace, um, First off, awesome to meet another soccer fan. Um, I really like the research that you did into it. it. I was really impressed by that. And it reminds me of how prosthetics kind of became cooler, you know, more curved. Um, and that was this guy researched into, I think, cougars, how, how they ran. Um, so I think you're really onto something good there. Thank you. Yeah, just, just to add to that, I think it was really nice to see your initial sketches and the prototypes behind it. That was really, really nice to see. Just Thank so I'd let you know. And your personal story as well. Yeah. It was really beautiful to start with. And just a quick thank you to those who were able to describe their images and their uh, videos while they were presenting. Thanks for that. I have a, a question for the, the bike. Yeah. I thought uh, the video was fantastic. It's a really, Thank really you. good storytelling and really, really nice to see an actual prototype working and, and getting that. And I just, I just wonder what your, your market, uh, sort of your USP is for why would uh, parents choose to buy your bike over a maybe uh, cheaper sort of buy now online or buy it in a store? So I'm actually thinking about uh, like solving a local needs by using local production. So I think it would be a really great um, system if it's uh, based in Brooklyn. Let's say there are uh, many very cool bike builders. So if they can get all those recycled handlebars and build uh, different shapes of the frame based on the, the size and the curve of, of the handlebars and build those bikes and return those bikes to that community to have like, it's like creating a closed loop so that the uh, bike riders in that community could like donate the, their rusted handlebars and then the bike builders could create different unique bikes and then return to the 
community for kids to ride the bikes. So instead of buying a you know like plastic uh, striders on Amazon, they can just like um, having a more like online and uh, interactive uh, active like activities. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think you've got a really great story, and I mm -hmm. think. If I was you, I'd, I'd really work on that story and that community. Mm -hmm. And again, those videos are really powerful to, to get those messages across. Okay, thank you. Maybe if, if you could briefly um, explain, I just there were so many projects and they all presented really quickly. What exactly is the bike and who is it meant for? Oh, uh, the bike is made of the, the whole frame of the bike. Is a uh, sorry. It's a balanced bike which doesn't have the the pedals, so it's for children to learn balancing. And um, so it's made of the whole bike is made of recycled handlebars. So uh, the body has contains two handlebars that cut it, uh, being cut in half and then welded together. So um, yeah, it's for um, uh, children to learn bike riding. So the goal of this project is to. Um, uh, letting the local bike fabricators to create something unique in that community and encourage children to learn bike riding instead of um, a, not, you know, like uh, playing with the scooters. So, yeah. I would maybe suggest also <laughs> consider designing um, different frames. For instance, um, there are the hand cycles. Um, and those are, you know, bikes that people with physical disabilities use. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it'd be great if kids with disabilities that are growing up could also just have that example for themselves mm -hmm. to be yeah. included as well. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, utilize the different curves of handlebars can create many different shapes and many, like, volume of um, the, the structure, yeah. Please give this group a big round of applause. If you are students in group number two, we would love for you to come up next.
Testing, testing. Um, hi everyone, my name is Ruja. I graduated from Pratt Institute and this project was done in my junior year. So assistive devices such as wheelchairs are designed to help people. However, sometimes they could highlight a person's impairments and further separate the so-called us versus them. For example, if I see someone in a wheelchair who is struggling a little bit, I wouldn't sure if it's right for me to help them. Without them asking, and if they can handle things on their own, but just in their own pace, I would worry if my offer of assistance could offend or embarrass them. So in order to better understand the other side of the story, I borrowed a wheelchair and rode myself. And when people, add, when people offered me help, that's when I realized the relationship is very imbalanced between the person sitting in a wheelchair and the person who pushes it. Because the former will always be at the end of receiving assistance, and they could offer very little back besides other than a word of thanks. And if we bring this conversation deeper, the person who pushes wheelchair could carry the burden of moral choices and the responsibility of helping others. And the person who sits in the wheelchair could have the pressure of uh, receiving help for granted. Uh, and the question, so the question for me was if we could somehow transfer the action of pushing the wheelchair to a mutually beneficial activity for the both parties, would this help to bridge the gap between these thoughts and feelings? And here is a short video. So what this device does is that it transfers this action to a group activity that is more grounded and less significant so that neither of them would feel, so that neither of them wouldn't think too much about it and then benefit both persons. I sincerely hope that this device would bring people closer and make objects like wheelchair a conversation starter instead of an ender. Thank you very much. My name is Mackenzie, and I'm a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon University. And this is Enlighten, which is an alert device for the iPad. Um, this is a picture of my grandmother saying I love you at a baseball game. Uh, her name is Nancy, and she's 85, and she was born deaf. Last Christmas, we gave her an iPad so that she can stay in touch with her children, grandchildren, and most importantly, her new great-granddaughter. So on the left, is an image of her opening up the iPad and on the right calling her great-granddaughter for the first time. 
Um, but I began to wonder, how could someone be alerted when they're away from the iPad? Right now, the iPad needs to be uncovered and within her eyesight in order for her to know if she has a message or a FaceTime. Uh, the problem is the iPad doesn't have vibration notification or light notification. And while this can often be alleviated by connected devices such as uh, an iWatch or an iPhone that you carry with you, at 85 years old, uh, she had neither. So I began to wonder, how can I use an alert convention that she's familiar with? Um, for example, lights flashing when the doorbell rings and apply that to the iPad. Um, and so I created Enlighten, which is a device that will monitor the iPad's brightness and trigger light notifications in another room. Um, and on the right is the Enlighten box sitting on the iPad, and on the left is a hacked together home decor item that lights up. Uh, and so I needed to find a constant variable that I could rely on to provide these alerts to her. Uh, on the left is an iPad with the black sleep state, and when a bright notification uh, any notification comes on to the iPad, iPhones, etc., the screen lights up. And so I thought I would use that. Um, and I didn't just want to propose or conceptualize. I began to learn about Arduino. And so I made a prototype that's, um, this video is the first prototype of holding a sensor to the screen and then having lights light up in reaction to that. Um, but in order to create an untethered device, I began to think of how I could integrate the cloud using Wi-Fi enabled boards and really have um, the device on the iPad in one room and lights light up in another room. Um, and so actually, if you would hit the home button on that phone, which is basically large enough, uh, the light over here is now lighting up. Um, and as soon as that goes dark, it's gonna turn off. Uh, and so moving in the future, I'd like to actually incorporate the Philips Hue, which has smart uh, cloud capabilities um, with the iPad uh, Enlightened Box device. Um, thank you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? This is pretty easy. Hi, so we're going to talk about our app called Pathfinder. And on the screen, you can see our logo, which is a uh, teal road with a gray background. On this next screen in the background, you can see an image of an unfinished sidewalk. Many People who are visually impaired depend on memorized travel routes. But changes to these routes and obstacles in these routes um, are our major inconvenience. Not only these inconveniences are disruptive, they can easily lead to and escalate into major hazards. Our design process began with a need-finding stage in which we conducted interviews with our target segment. We mo then moved on to prototyping in which we brainstormed a design for an application for the smartphones and conducted market research. We finished with a feedback stage in which we discussed design with the broader disabled community and made adjustments. Uh, the next screen has a background image of an urban area and features the Pathfinder logo again. Pathfinder is an application that crowdsources information about pedestrian obstacles. This information from the wider community is then used to generate safer routes for disabled travelers, similar to the navigation app Waze, if anyone is familiar. Uh, so there's three screens from our app that we thought would be important to share with you guys. The first is our uh, obstruction selection screen. This is where contributors would uh, be able to pick from a selection of typical obstructions in addition to having an other option available for atypical ones. Uh, to the right here, we have a mock-up of what this might look like visually. Uh, there's a grid of buttons laid out with icons on them corresponding to obstructions like construction, car accidents, fallen trees. Uh, our second screen is our hazard report screen. Uh, this is what contributors would come to after having selected an obstruction. Um, and this is where they could submit more detailed information about the nature of that obstruction and also its location. Uh, so the right, we have another screen cap uh, where we have a button to record, 
a place to uh, input more information, and a map uh, to pinpoint a location. Uh, the final uh, screen we have here is our map overview screen. And this is essentially a city map that updates in real time as contributors uh, submit obstruction reports. Uh, so as a user, uh, you would receive an alert or notification whenever an obstruction happened to intersect one of your typical routes. Uh, so our last screen cap on the right again is a city map with pins in it, and each of the pins has an icon that represents different obstructions. So some further considerations about our app are that we came in with the principles of universal design in mind so that everyone would be able to use it. We're also providing a service that cities, that cities currently lack, and they'll be able to improve public safety by drawing on the information that the app provides. Furthermore, in order to encourage users to actually submit information to the app, we wanted to engage them as a community. For example, we wanted to enable them to broadcast the information that they submit to social media to solicit things like Facebook likes and positive affirmation from other users. Finally, we wanted to gamify the process in order to encourage a submission similar to how other apps have done. Thank you very much. Give our panelists a little time to collect your thoughts, but um, do you have any questions for the first project, Luja's Wheelchair 2.0? Can you reiterate what exactly, so it's a wheelchair, and how does it benefit both folks? I, I didn't catch that. Um, so the wheelchair has a heart rate monitor uh, on the handle, and it's for the person who pushes the wheelchair to use. So basically, um, this project was more conceptual than practical. Mm -hmm. and the idea was to find a way somehow to benefit the person who pushes the wheelchair as well, and hence this activity now benefits both sides. Sure. Um, so I, I'm going to su su sort of suggest that um, Something that is sort of always neglected is the actual health of people with disabilities and their opportunities for athletic activities. So I would, I would try to think from your end, how can both parties be physically doing something that is engaging and not just the one able-bodied person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. How would the person know about this? How would the person know about this? And, <laughs> and um, you know, uh, be attracted to use it? Um. <laughs> well, um, the, the idea is that it's under um, the assumption that someone, like these two people are strangers and in case they pass each other and the one person was thinking about helping the other and then this device would encourage this thought to put it into action. I guess I'm asking, how would they know about that? How, how would they know about it? That yeah. it existed. It is a good <laughs> question. Um, yeah, I wasn't, I didn't focus too much about that. It was, I was focusing on if there were way to uh, bring this gap of, uh, in the psychology level, yeah. Yeah, it's a very like, important. Yeah, you track. could, you can, if you argue this object is not practical, I'm fine with it. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, I just, you know, basically, I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting idea. Um, I just think that we, we want to try to empower people with disabilities instead of just having things the same and then having the benefit only really benefit the able-bodied person. So, like, one thing that um, comes to mind is um, sometimes <laughs> I, I'm blind and sometimes I actually do walk with people uh, that use wheelchairs and will actually double up. So I have uh, sometimes you know, trouble perceiving the environment around me and getting around, and they 
they might get tired of pushing. So I will push and they will steer, you know? Yeah. So that we're, we're both benefiting and, and we're both kind of on equal ground instead of sort of one person being, first of all, get, getting like their good deed for the day and mm -hmm. getting exercise out of it and the other person is just kind of used, you yeah. know? Yeah, so. definitely. Okay, do we have any questions for Mackenzie's Enlighten? Keep talking. Uh, so I love that you were inspired by your grandma, oh, first and foremost. That's incredible. Yeah. And that you were looking at redefining her traditional alert convention. So since she's visual, you went to a primary visual mode, which I love. My question is, have you thought about other applications? One example of this uh, in my own life, so I have a coworker who's fully deaf, mm -hmm. who couldn't hear her carbon monoxide alarm go off for three weeks in her home. Mm -hmm. um, and so we look at a lot of things like light and how that might be applicable mm -hmm. for danger and for all kinds of alerts beyond your tablet or your iPhone. And then my kind of comment to that is, um, with the senior community or otherwise, looking at different colors, mm -hmm. obviously there's a memory association there, yeah. which I'll put pain to the side for a moment, but looking at different colors for different kinds of alert types. Mm -hmm. So those are my two questions slash feedback points for you. I have. Um, I actually lived with her for three years, and so those were often concerns of, did she leave a window open, and is there a breeze coming in? Um, one day her toilet was running, but she couldn't hear it, and due to her age, she couldn't really see the water running. Um, so I am looking at exploring other avenues, especially in the home. Um, I just started to get into physical computing, and I saw this as something that I felt like I could tackle now. Um, but starting out here and living with her, it's, it has opened my eyes to other sounds around the home, very minute sounds that could benefit from a visual alert. And as far as color, I haven't considered color yet. Um, like I said, in the future, I'm looking into the Philips Hue, which for right now I'm exploring just the white ones, but I know that they do come in color ranges, so I think I could um, target depending on where a sensor is placed, for instance, um, maybe it could have another, the light bulb could light up red. And is it um, like when I we press the home screen mm -hmm. and the light lights up? Yes. And the light only stays lit up as long as it is on the home screen? Yes. So the duration of time is consistent with duration of time on your screen? Yes. But what happens if you don't see that in that exact fleeting moment? So I am um, also looking into um, some kind of delays or if, Maybe she, you hadn't seen movement or something. You know, maybe it does it again. Uh, or maybe it does it every one minute or so. So they're all great questions. Thank you. Um, so yes. one thing that you will um, hear a lot from designers and, and people with disabilities is to try to be, uh, take a multimodal approach. Mm -hmm. um, lighting is great, but I've already said before, like, some people who are, some older adults, right, experience vision loss. Mm -hmm. So it'd be good to have other outputs, um, such as sound or vibration or haptics as well. Um, so just something to think about. Yes, I, have, I definitely have been on even maybe haptics within a wearable that could be tied to it. Yeah, I just want to say I think it's a really, really great product. Thank you. And it, it's something that I constantly, I use Skype a lot, mm -hmm. and I constantly miss Skype calls coming through, constantly, and I think it would be something that I would use. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, as you just said, I think you should explore the co colors as well. So if, so if, you know, colors, sounds, all different applications for, for different people with different abilities and needs, and I think it, it would just be so great if Skype call comes through and it was, you know, one color, and then maybe a message comes through and it's, it's a different color or a different sound or different vibe, you know, some mm -hmm. kind of flashing or something. It's just so that, you know, I know a message is coming through. I'm not rushing then to go try and reach my iPad. Yeah. Or if a Skype call, call comes through, I know I need to move a little bit faster to, to reach yeah. that call. And I think, yeah, I think it's a really, really great product. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to the last group for the Pathway app. Do you have any questions or comments for them? Um, 
I have a question that probably will be followed by a comment, but uh, the, the question is, initially, where are you collecting your data? Are you finding any data on this already? Um, are you just going to depend on the users generating this data initially? When you say data, do you mean this, like the submissions of the hazards? Yeah, the actual hazards and stuff, yes, the obstacles. So yeah, so we were relying primarily on users to, and, and feel free to jump in, uh, primarily on users to actually submit this information. And one of, one of our concerns was actually building a sufficient user base to uh, get enough people to actually map out what hazards are out there, since um, especially in places either where there's lower population or lower pedestrian traffic, that might be a concern. Um, so there, we had a couple of different solutions in mind to that. Um, one of them was porting it onto an existing crowdsourcing uh, service, uh, such as we mentioned Waze as an example, um, that also use, you know, creates navigation tools um, so that we would have enough people out there to actually build up enough information. Cool. Um, and on top of that, um, there, you know, there's a community of open data um, that is just becoming more and more popular. So governments are also becoming more transparent and using more open data. For instance, the city of New York has um, a list that is um, basically a map and a data set that is all of the construction sites in New York City and what their statuses are. And it's updated, I think, on a monthly basis. So looking into that, you, that might be a good jump off point for you guys. Yeah, if I can just comment on that. Uh, that was definitely one of our uh, considerations and intentions to be able to partner with uh, cities on this uh, kind of for public safety reasons. Um, so it would be kind of another platform where they could kind of share things about construction sites as they come up to reach more people uh, in a faster amount of time. I have so many questions. I'm going to narrow to two for you. So my question, and I have, I have a comment, two questions, a comment. So questions, I know that you talked about crowdsourcing as one input. Have you considered machine learning and AI as another input? And then my second question is, are you looking at different forms of notifications? Because I didn't quite get from the video, and maybe because it happened so fast, but you talked about the input. So I'm putting in there's a hazard on this street on this road, but how the person receives all of the notifications and the multiple forms that that comes in? Have you considered all of the different modes of notification? And then my comment is that you should look up Cities Unlocked Guide Dogs. If you are not familiar with that body of work, um, take a look at it. It's uh, a lot of work that Microsoft's doing in this space that might be interesting to you as you look at this project. Uh, yeah, so just in response to your second question, um, so right now we are kind of imagining that users would receive the notifications and alerts uh, similar to the way that um, you receive alerts on your smartphone now. So it would be, uh, you would receive like a buzz if it was in your, on your phone. Uh, it would want to be able to also make it audio enabled. So uh, Peter worked with us a lot and he talked about how he receives alerts and how he responds to those things uh, as someone who's visually impaired. Um, and we were also imagining, one of the things that we were kind of thinking of uh, was that some people struggle just using smartphones. So for the purposes of more accessibility, um, connecting it with some sort of uh, phone system where you could be also notified at a certain time, maybe at the beginning of the day, of potential construction hazards or things that have appeared uh, over the course of the last day or something. So yeah, so some examples of what this might look like in addition to what Paul just said is, so for example, the, my phone could learn uh, what my typical paths are and stuff like that. Like let's say I typically go from one street to work and they, or I could input what my home is and what my work is and it learns the paths I usually take. It would automatically let me know before I head on my journey that um, you know, there's, an, there's an issue on the way and it would make a suggested alternative route or if I encounter something spontaneously, I can whip out my phone and it will tell me what are the nearby obstacles and it will suggest an alternative path around that. And then, How much thought have you guys put into that in terms of like I, I, like, I imagine myself putting in my home address and my work address and there's five different ways to get there. So uh, how is it gonna predict stuff that is actually on my way as opposed to telling me an obstacle that is in a route that I'm not taking, but but still takes me to work. 
Uh, well, I think uh, one aspect of that is um, when it comes to people's uh, routines, uh, people often have a routine route, for example, from their home to work or other destinations they often use. Um, so I think it would work on that basis in the sense that it would notify them of uh, obstacles on that particular route. And um, beyond that, uh, there would be options to uh, choose other routes and, uh, you know, we, along with the crowdsourcing concept, we're hoping that there will be information about the other routes as well. Do you have something? Yeah, and on top of what Jahan said, yeah, so people typically take one particular path, but then you could kind of expand or limit how much feedback you wanted it to give you. So if you wanted to get maximum feedback, if you wanted to have a really varied you know, path to work, then you could have it give you all the possible um, hazards in a, a much wider range, or you could limit it just to your more typical paths. Cool. Um, and to just give you some more uh, advice uh, regarding her previous questions about the notifications, you guys had already addressed that in that you said you're making your app uh, universally, you know, you're universally designing your app, which means that you're making it accessible on those devices, and those devices are universally designed, so they're going to have multimodal outputs. So. <laughs> At this point, we're going to take a brief break for 10 minutes. So if you'd like to use the restrooms, again, they are on the ground floor. And we will transition to group number three.
Davis Dunaway. If you are here, please come to the podium. Davis Dunaway, if you are present, please come to the podium. Davis Dunaway, please come to the podium. Hello everyone, kindly take your seats. We're getting ready to start the next round. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sovic Paul, I'm from the School of Visual Arts. I'm here today to tell you about a medical device that I designed called QueenCath. But before I do that, I'd like to tell you a story. And this story begins with a car accident. On the screen you can see my friend Karina, she's sitting in a wheelchair holding a picture of a car. This is the car that she was driving on a California freeway when a tractor trailer rear-ended her. The force of the accident severed her spinal cord and rendered her paralyzed from the chest down. Uh, I was in the hospital when she found out that she would never walk again, and that was a moment that I don't think I'll ever forget. A few weeks later, I started at design school, and when I was sitting in the classroom learning about design skills for the first time, the only question that kept repeating itself through my head was, how can I use design to help my friend? So I started researching spinal cord injury, and I learned that for people with these injuries, the connection between their brain and their bladder is interrupted, so they can't feel when they need to urinate, they can't control when they urinate. To account for this, they use these uh, small plastic tubes called catheters. They insert them through their urethra until it reaches the bladder, which allows urine to drain out of their body. But insurance doesn't always cover the six catheters that you need to urinate every day, so people reuse them. They'll wash them under soap and water, they'll boil them, they'll microwave them, and then they'll keep them in Tupperwares like the ones you see on the screen, uh, the entire process of which leaves them prone to developing urinary tract infections. Recognizing this key unmeet, unmet user need, I decided to de design a device that would help them reliably sterilize their used catheters. I learned about UVC, which is a spectrum of light that can kill pathogens on contact by disrupting the bonds in their DNA. <laughs> And by disrupting existing sterilizing wands that use UVC and creating foam mock-ups of what my device might look like, I ended up designing CleanCath, a portable catheter sterilizer that uses the power of UVC light to disinfect used catheters, giving users peace of mind and greater independence. By using the device, they can transition from needing 2,200 catheters a year to just needing 50. Um, to use it, they place their used catheters into the body of the device, close the lid, and initiate the sterilization cycle. Five minutes later, their catheter is clean and ready to be used again. The device itself doesn't look like your classic medical device. It's sleek, it's um, portable, it's handheld, it has a grip for uh, users with limited dexterity. It even comes in a variety of finishes like wood, anodized aluminum, rose gold and matte black. And while that might sound like a superficial distinction to make, for people who rely on medical devices every day of their life uh, for normal function, giving users a sense of agency, a sense of control over the aesthetic choices of their lives, brings a sense of pride to a practice that's otherwise associated with shame. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Laura Rodriguez, and I'm a master's student at Carnegie Mellon University. So my project is Fluid, which is an adaptive drinking aid for bedridden <coughs> patients. So I was inspired to look at this problem watching my family look for an adaptive drinking aid for my father who was in home hospice. Um, dehydration is a serious issue for people who are bedridden. It can cause constipation and it can compromise the immune system. So I wanted to look at what is a drinking aid. So I did market research. On the screen are illustrations of different types of drinking aids that are on the market. The most common one that's recommended by hospice nurses is the ergonomic plastic one that has the ridges. Um, there were some physical issues with all of the different types of drinking aids, including leakage, they have to be set on tables, and items like that. But the main two things I focused on was patient movement and the inflexibility for transitions. So in terms of patient movement, a lot of the cups made the patients have to sit up or they have to reach for a cup on a table, and as they become weaker, it's more difficult to do those things, so they can't access liquid independently. In terms of transitions, a patient may start in a bed, but they may transition to a hospital bed, or they may have to use a wheelchair or a walker. So a lot of the times the cups have to sit on a table, so some of those scenarios are not feasible. I also looked at, while well, I was looking at more of a permanent scenario with home hospice, I did look at a temporary scenario to get an understanding of all the different situations a patient may be in. So they may go from a hospital bed to a standard bed, they may go from a wheelchair to a walker, just to get an understanding of the whole um, ecosystem that's there. So the main thing I was focusing on was how can a cup be designed to fit the needs and be more accessible to the patient. So in, here are some of my sketches on the screen. And I was exploring form and material to, get, to develop something that would fit the body more. So on the screen are two images. One is the two different sizes, the four ounce size and the eight ounce size, and then also showing the silicone material flexibility. So I focused on three elements, a flexible material and form. So I chose silicone because it allows um, a patient with a weaker grasp to hold on to better to the cup. And then I also chose a wide narrow form to, for more surface area. I also included a long flexible straw so they would reduce the amount of sitting up motion. So they bring the cup to them. And then I also included removable accessories. And here are some of the examples. So one for making it into a handle, one for putting on a hospital bed, and one for clipping to a blanket. And then one for storage. So this allows it to be transition with the patient. Thank you. <laughs> full screen, but that's fine. All right. I, I don't actually have slides, I apologize, but I just have, uh, I have a picture of the, um, the poster that I made. So at um, the beginning of this winter break, I had two very profound experiences that really aff uh, affected the way I think about and approach accessibility, and especially in design. Um, the first of which is I got to wear a continuous blood glucose monitor um, over the course of several weeks and got to um, kind of participate in some of the daily routines that a diabetic goes through on a daily basis. And the other was that I met and had discussions with a homeless man named Richard who um, unfortunately had his camp cleared completely out before several days before Christmas and he was left without very many possessions of any kind. Um, upon hearing about this, composition, uh, this competition, I realized that I could take those two experience, uh, experiences I had and combine them together to tackle the issue of um, chronic illness in the homeless population. Since the homeless population is also is so often completely neglected in, um, from things that we would consider necessities of our everyday lives. Um, my approach to this was a medical kiosk called HMEC. Um, it, the kiosk comes equipped with two cameras for um, viewing users who are both standing and 
um, in a wheelchair a screen to provide both visual feedback as well as um, a way of um, using touch to communicate with the device as well as a speaker and mic to um, get auditory feedback and give auditory response. Um, upon uh, approaching the machine, a user could let, let it know whether or not it was a new or returning user and um, scan into the device, the device using a fingerprint. Um, if they were a new user, a small lancet would, fin would finger prick and draw a small blood sample, which would then have several tests conduct on, conducted on it and be sent to a database where it could be analyzed by a doctor who could then provide a treatment plan. The, the importance of this treatment plan and this, having this kiosk is that the, so a, a member of the homeless community could not only just get diagnosis once and then treatment once, they could approach it, get diagnosis, get, and get reoccurring feedback that changes as, as their condition changes. So this kiosk could also deliver medicine on a daily basis in, instead of having to prescribe month or week long prescriptions that they likely won't be able to hold on to. Um, but yeah, that, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Aditi, and this is actually a picture I took last summer when I was hiking through the Himalayas. And there was, a un there was something unexpected that happened where I didn't realize that I had to go to the bathroom and there were none. And after holding it in for a very long time, I eventually had to give in and go pee in the bushes. And I felt really embarrassed, to be honest, and it got me to the question, why was I shy of something so natural? I was at that point really jealous of my male counterparts who could really freely go anywhere. And this was, I know it's funny, but 20 to 40% of military women suffer from urinary tract infection. And it is because of that same embarrassment that I felt that day on that hike that they suffer the urinary tract infection. I was reading testimonies from the military and it was shocking on how the kind of experiences they have related to urination. For instance, uh, the inconvenience of being inside a truck or inside, since it's a military, they need to be in enclosed environments or wearing bad fitting pants. So a lot of the women have to wear pants with the measurements of a man or the embarrassment of, um, since it's a traditionally male dominated society, uh, field, a lot of the time like, they are laughed at for, being, for exposing themselves. So going back to history a little bit, and I began to question the history of pants and design, and why should I be, blame my female body for a design problem? So um, in the 1800s, men f began um, wearing pants so that they could ride horses, and so they were ergonomically designed for men. And later on, women adopted them. So they were actually adaptations, and the female body had to adopt according to how they pee instead of, instead of what, um, what should have happened is pants should have been ergonomically designed according to female anatomy. So I began repatterning the pants uh, for the military, and I began testing out standing versus squatting, which scenarios are better. And turns out standing is actually a possibility for women, and it's actually cleaner, more discreet, and easier, actually. So I began with a systems approach of redesigning two things, the undergarment and the pant. So here I have my product, where it follows three simple steps. You unbutton it, you stretch the central tab, and then you pour as far as you want to pee. 
So I repeat, you unbutton five buttons, you stretch the central spandex tab, and then you urinate. The easy access also allows one to pee inside uh, a cup, maybe, or it's even more discreet in terms of like standing up and being in front. Uh, it hides, so it's same like for a man, like you go into a corner and you can. So there are three dip, uh, three significant details. One is the stretch seam, which allows uh, the fabric to go further than it can. There's the undergarment which front opens and is compatible with the pant. And then there are the buttons, which meet up with the military standards. So I've discovered a clean, discreet, accessible way to urinate for women. Thank you. Okay, if our panel is ready, um, the first round of questions and comments will be for Suvik for his product, Clean Cat. Yeah, I can, I can start with that. Um, I was interested when you, when you talked about the aesthetics of the product, and I was just interested to find out when did you decide how the balance was, so form, function, Uh, so I had started at design school kind of um, from a perspective that function is way more important than form when it comes to design for disability. Uh, and it was through uh, reading different books in the field, talking to users, that I realized that there is this big disparity between objects that are designed for people with disabilities and objects that are designed for um, everyone else. So in the book, design. Uh, Design Meets Disability by Graham Pullen, he talks about the difference between uh, bikes and wheelchairs and how if you look at wheelchairs, they all look pretty much the same, but if you look at bikes, the, the variety is just tremendous. Uh, so from reading that book and talking to users, I realized that um, the way that medical devices all look exactly the same, they all kind of have um, like white plastic with blue trim. Um, that actually ends up dehumanizing the user. Um, so I think what I discovered for myself was when it comes to design for disability, it's not a question of form versus function, it has to be form and function. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point and I'm, I'm really happy to see that you, uh, you had lots of different versions and different colors and different uh, textures. I, yeah, I think that was really good. Thank you. Yeah, I support that too. Um, I really, really think that it's, it's a, uh, just, I really like the fact that you're trying to make it something aesthetically pleasing as well. I, um, myself, I use what's called a white cane, and none of my canes are white um, because I want to be fashionable. I don't, you know, it's like I'm living in the world, not a hospital. So, you know, my canes are like black and green and blue and purple, and so I'm a big fan of that. Um, just some constructive feedback. Um, I would maybe reconsider the way that you introduce your idea. Um, when it comes to the disability community, uh, this sort of origin story and, you know, it, it, was, it was a little bit more on the sad side. So, I mean, I, 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 I understand that you were trying to set up how you got your idea, so I, I would not uh, it's not like I'm saying don't mention it, but maybe make it a bit um, shorter and, you know, like say this idea was inspired by my friend uh, and not go as much into of this accident and, and the medical sort of, uh, you know, the process that she went through and, and things like that. Uh, I'm only saying that because that's a very typical way to start um, talking about a project and it's it's a... It's the easiest way to lose, to lose the disability community. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Okay, the next round of questions are for Laura for Fluid. Um, I thought the presentation was wonderful. 
Uh, the sketches were great, and you know, I could see your thought process and everything. Um, I guess I'm curious what kind of testing you did for different types of hand sizes and capabilities with uh, grasping and holding and all that. So this project is still, I'd like to iter on, iterate on it more. So at the moment, I had access to sorry, <laughs> speaking with doctors and nurses and hospice nurses. So I have more of a medical kind of perspective right now. So the next steps would be actually, because it was a personal project, so I didn't really have the ability to form it in actual silicone and things like that. So I would like to make a manufactured piece and actually really test it and try it. So that's really my next steps. I hope to just continue this project. I think if, if you get the opportunity to make it in the correct materials, I'd love to, for you to uh, give it to a, a toddler because um, I think also that, that idea of them being able to hold it, it's something squishy, um, they can throw it, they can, you know, the toddlers, they'll tip anything down them and I think it's the same idea with when you consider um, uh, patients in bed. I personally, and my partner has, uh, his grandfather's just had a stroke and he's lost side in one, of, uh, one side of his face and he also on the right side of his body. So him drinking, his ability to drink has become um, something you know, that he's experienced now and I think something like this could, could be really helpful for, for him and I also think that, that it has a broader, broader usage as well for that. Yeah, when I was designing it, I did see that this could be used for children or even for people who do sports or things like that. Um, and I do believe that like, when you kind of design for people at an extreme, it can be used for multiple people. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, our next round of questions will be for Davis Dunaway for Homeless Medical Evaluation Kiosk. I'm curious, will doctors, um, is it ethically possible for them to diagnose um, from afar, not being there with the patient in front of them? Like? Um, the amount of, like, the, the rate of progress that, like, the amount of things you can diagnose from a blood sample is going up exponen exponentially, like, every year. Um, and that, in combination with um, visuals provided by um, pictures, actually does provide for a lot of possible diagnosis. Um, one possible thing that I was considering on adding is um, an easy way to take blood pressure um, through um, a, a device that clips onto your finger, because hypertension is the most prominent um, medical disability in the homeless community, um, which can't be diagnosed through blood, but could be diagnosed through monitoring blood pressure. I'm curious, you may have mentioned this, uh, and I missed it. How much would that cost to build? Um, I don't have like a set price, but the idea behind it is because you're not designing for an individual, you're designing for a group of people, and every kiosk, like a kiosk can be a standalone unit, not, it doesn't have to be in a network, it just needs the database in itself. The price of one would probably be quite pricey, but as you build the next one, and the next one, and the next one, um, it doesn't have that same pr uh, cost associated with it. Um, but depending on where you put it, if you put it in an area like New York or the Bay Area, where you have a, an extremely high percentage of the homeless population, the the amount of people it will help will very, very likely be offset by the price. But yeah, it's kind of a utopian solution, but it's because it's designing for groups of people and not individuals, I think it moves more towards um, being realistic. Makes sense, yeah. Have you thought about um, maintenance and um, cleanliness? New York City is, you know, it could get pretty dirty. Um, there, there's always the issue of vandalism, which um, while I haven't thought about um, actual, like, how this machine could maintain itself in front of vandalism, it would be placed in areas that are well monitored, so even, like, places, I, at least in the Bay Area where I'm from, um, a lot of the congregation sites for people who are homeless are by fast food restaurants like McDonald's and places that are monitored 
pretty much 24 hours a day, um, which would help with vandalism. In terms of cleanliness, I have done research into membranes that are self-cleansing for things like the fingerprint sensor and um, the lancet. Lancets are usually disposable, so lancets would be replaced after use. Cool. I wonder if you could combine it with uh, existing kiosks that, like, New York has. Um, I was thinking the same thing. Um, but also, I would, I'm not positive about this, but I think there are problems with vandalism for the New York City kiosks also. Is that correct? There's what? <laughs> um, one sec. Oh, uh, problems with vandalism for the New York City kiosk. Is that correct? I think so. I, I, I'm not sure, but vandalism in general is a big problem. So I don't know if it's specific to the kiosk. So I, I do think that that's a good idea. Um, uh, there's, we're replacing all the phone booths in New York City with um, kiosks called Link NYC. And they have cameras, uh, they have, they're connected to the internet, they actually give out um, free Wi-Fi, and they have charging stations as well, USB charging. Um, so there, that might be something that you might want to maybe model after so to, to adapt one of those somehow um, and uh, it's for that purpose. I would also look at, this is an incredible idea and I love your inspiration, also look at other forms, like does it always have to live in a kiosk or for instance St. Louis tested something quite similar in like the size of a food truck, essentially, where it was mobile and they could go from homeless camp to homeless camp, uh, set up and then leave at a certain time. So they had set hours, so they only needed one um, or just a few, but could cover mass territory mm -hmm. with that construct. So I would encourage you to think about different form factors as well beyond kiosk. Can I just add one more thing? I was just thinking as well, um, when, you, when you talked about uh, helping the homeless in this situation, and it's a, it's a big topic anyway, <laughs> And my thought process then went to widen if this 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 could uh, could be moved. Um, wh what about disaster relief situations? I think you know if this is a database that's linking back to uh, doctors and stuff like that. That you know in these uh, disaster situations that maybe it could be an opportunity to speed up the process of okay. So now you know what these people have and you have names and whatever it is to speed up the process of when they actually visit the doctor beforehand or if they can put out medical um, um, yeah, stuff automatically. So just thinking if, if you're tackling a big topic anyway, maybe look even further into it. For um, Aditi. So I have a question. Uh, I've worked on this particular, in this particular problem space in healthcare for a very long time, so I'm fascinated and amazed and excited about what you came up with. Uh, I'm curious how you got to the origin of choosing the military as your target audience. I think I have an assumption as to why, but I'm curious because it's something like 85 or 90 percent of women in general get UTIs frequently, uh, particularly when you look at any kind of backpacking, hiking, and I'm seeing what you're making and I'm thinking, Ari, I should sell this. Partner with Patagonia. <laughs> Go beyond military. So I'm curious how you came up with that for your origin or your target um, audience. So I was thinking about, I'm of the strong belief that whenever there is a cultural shift in society, there's always problems near that area. So I, was, I recently read how the US Army had allowed women into special combat rules, so which puts women in positions where they haven't been in the past. So they were like stuck in these austere environments without access to toilets. And there are, the, actually when I started talking to people in the Army, there were a lot of other sanitary issues that they were, had to combat. But this was of very particular interest to me because it was like they did provide a solution which did not work. So they were providing these uh, funnels that women were using, but it required storage. It did not consider the cleanliness of it and things like that. So it, it kind of startled me how like the pant itself couldn't be redesigned for them. I love it. Thank you. Yeah.
Yeah, I think this is a really cool idea as well. And um, I think this is also something that um, could be very beneficial for the disability community, given that people with disabilities have a hard time finding an accessible bathroom. So you know, I know people who will wear diapers and things like that for that specific problem. So I, I think this could be helpful for the disability community. Um, have you thought of also, you said the, the, the design you made is for standing, right? Is there one maybe, or is, is there an, already an existing one for um, someone who's sitting who might be using a wheelchair? Or? Um, this specific one was uh, tied strongly to the needs of um, the military women. But definitely there are opportunities that it can be scaled up where there are solutions um, where people have been using like this funnel kind of equipment, especially for hiking and for people with incontinence. But at the same time, um, there hasn't been a design, redesign for the pant itself, which was something that was like a different approach. And sitting is, it just brings it to a very different scenario and circumstances. Great, please give this group a round of applause. Thank you. And final group. Can I just use this? Hi, um, my name is Shana, and I'm from Pratt Institute, and I'm presenting SPRY to you today. So I originally defined my problem with a personal story. I have been uh, disabled for the past three years from a chronic illness and have used a cane off and on. So it was basically three years of free research, and I noticed how many problems there were functionally with canes, and then also addressing the stigma of being disabled uh, as a 22-year-old. So I started doing all this historical research and thinking, why are canes so stigmatized? And it was actually really interesting. Um, so uh, on the screen I have the fun fact that in 1700s London, you had to have a license to use a cane. And it was such a privilege and a symbol of power and prestige. And it wasn't until after World War II when so many soldiers came home injured that the cane became a necessity and the stigmatized medical device we know today. So I started doing the field research, and I noticed many different things, um, but the two main problems that I noticed were that people hold their canes differently, even though cane designs are really meant to be held one way. So they are sacrificing their comfort and their usability. Also, about 80% of the people that I took photographs of had the same cane, 
including myself, I had this one. And I'm like, we're this different age, different gender. I would not wear anything you're wearing. You know, why do I have to have the same cane as you? So this brought me to Spry. And um, functionally, uh, the, focused on the handle and being able to grip any way you like. Um, so you can see on the screen that there are three different people um, ranging in ages and genders um, because I wanted this cane to be not just for the elderly but also for um, people who are young so they can hold the cane differently. Uh, the canes, a lot of canes don't rest on tables and they're often falling over um, and it's just causing a lot of worry. So I wanted the cane to be able to rest um, on tables or on chairs or as you can see right here, my prototype is just resting on the podium. Um, so the cane's really working for us. The user doesn't have to work for the cane. And then lastly, um, I wanted the cane to be able to be customized um, and make it a product about individuality. So you could buy it online and customize your colors or patterns and really make it an extension of who you are and something that you can be proud of to use and not something um, that's like this medical product that a 22-year-old or an 80-year-old doesn't want to use. Uh, so thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Julia Lemley and I'm a master's student at the Rhode Island School of Design studying industrial design. Today I'm going to talk about Venture, which is a professional walker. Now if I was to tell you that many of us in this room would be working in our 80s or maybe even our 90s, you might say that that sounds a little insane, um, maybe like something out of a science fiction novel. But last fall, I started thinking about a few different trends. We're living longer, most Americans don't save enough money for retirement, and we can't count on Social Security being there, at least for those in my generation. So the financial math of retiring at 66 or 67, it just doesn't add up. Uh, this slide shows statistics on what I've just mentioned. When I later interviewed a number of professionals in their 50s, 60s, and 70s about their relationship to work, two themes emerged. The first was that almost all of them expressed a desire to keep working indefinitely, saying that they were engaged in the most meaningful work of their lives. And the second was that most had a story about a friend or a colleague who had been unceremoniously forced out, ostensibly because of their age. On this slide, I've included some quotes from those interviews. This raised for me a fundamental disconnect. On the one hand, uh, working past the typical retirement age, either out of desire or financial necessity, is not only possible, but frankly probable. On the other hand, age discrimination is still pervasive, especially in the workplace. So while our demographics and financial realities are shifting, our society's attitudes about aging just aren't keeping up. So I wanted to make an object about this disconnect, something that would make people examine their own preconceptions about what a professional looks like. I took as a vehicle for this idea a walker. On this slide, you'll see walkers as we know them today. Now, a walker is a tool that you might need if your body, though not necessarily your mind, needs support. But the aesthetic of the walker is one of a medical device. Its visual language is that of a hospital, not of a workplace. So I wanted to make a walker specifically for an octogenarian professional. To counteract the prevailing aesthetic, I took inspiration from wildly different fields. I looked at the aesthetics and production quality of handcrafted furniture and of the design of modern offices. This led me to make the piece by hand, out of ash and walnut, and to spend time on more premium details like mirrored wood grain. I thought about gestures that might suggest forward movement and pride, which led to the juxtaposition of curves and straight lines. And on this slide, I have images of my production process. 
This slide shows the final piece, and it, it sort of looks something like a, the shell of a podium. Now, I have to say it's somewhat ironic um, to present this piece in the context of an exhibition about accessibility and inclusion, because in some ways, this is the antithesis of inclusive product design. It's solid wood, so it's a little bit heavy. Uh, it doesn't have wheels, it doesn't collapse, and it's not particularly ergonomic. You might notice a conspicuous lack of users after my initial research phase. And that's because it's, it's not really an accessible product so much as a product about accessibility. I believe that we need both, designs that point out a problem and designs that solve those problems. And my hope is that my walker will draw attention to the biases towards elder professionals and to encourage people to think more inclusively about what a professional looks like. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chen Li. Um, currently, I'm a student at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, the project I'm presenting to you today is called Soft Phonate, which is supportive armrest for people with limited mobility. A journey of this project started with my research and observation. Um, I found that many people, especially the elderly, encounter a limit in dexterity and mobility. As part of my research, I went to a senior center, and I took the photo at the senior center, uh, the one that I put up here in the slide. Um, there was no armrest in, for the dining chair at the senior center, and I noticed that some of the elderly had to lean onto the table to be able to sit down slowly. So this, and then plus all the, uh, the research that I leads me to this problem of how can I enhance the experience of getting in and out of dining chairs for users with limited mobility. With this question in my mind, I sketch out different solutions. Um, and then the one I landed on uh, was the one that on the right side of the slide, which is the idea of a chair with slightly extended armrest uh, to provide the user with easier grab to sit down. And due to the li time limitation of the pro project itself, uh, I decided to adapt on an existing chair and focusing on the design of the armrest itself. And I, uh, 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 during the research, I came across a chair, a very classic chair called Sony chair. Uh, it was uh, a bandwood chair and was simple, modern looking, and it is uh, quite often used in a restaurant and cafe. So I was thinking that's a really great start for um, adaption. And as um, and I made many of the iterations and form development using different materials such as metal and wood. And uh, um, at last, I came across this uh, material of foam, uh, which will give users a better and comfortable grip when they use the uh, armrest. And the result is a soft phonate. Uh, and I brought the chair that I adapted uh, back to the senior center and tested with uh, users. I got a many good feedback. At the same time, uh, there's a lot of things that I can, that I can improve on, such as the thickness of the armrest and the weight of the material because um, the core is using the metal bar. Um, um, and then being, that being said, um, the idea of balancing the aesthetics and function uh, for people who might have special needs was something that I tried to express through this project. And it's something that I would like to carry on as a designer. And thank you all. Can you guys hear me? I'm kind of short. Let me adjust that. 
Hi guys, feel free to shake it off. We've had a long day. I'm the last person to present, but definitely not least. Um, so, hi guys, my name is Nikki Escobar. I am an industrial designer from Cal State Long Beach, and I'm here to talk to you guys today about disability being sexy. So, I'm gonna get right into it and... So the target user that I was trying to help were individuals with lower limb amputations. And the main problem that I really wanted to help with them was the fact that their current prosthetic liners leave their users and their, and their residual limbs feeling very hot, really sweaty, they get pain from abrasion, and it becomes extremely uncomfortable for them. So I sought to create a more um, breathable and comfortable prosthetic liner. So throughout my process, I made so many connections in building my project. I visit amputee support groups, I interviewed them, I got to hear their stories, I went to their picnics, I consulted with prosthetic companies, actual prosthetists in the field, and even got connected with a prosthetic school that um, actually helped me build my prototype for free. So over here is kind of one of my posters, and it's a visual representation from my research, identifying problems, um, all the connections I created from ideating and prototyping my design. So I'm gonna introduce to you my project, which is Python. And what it is, it's a more breathable and comfortable prosthetic liner that aims to make any individual with amputation feel sexy. So some of the materials in it is a type of dry fit material on the inside to kind of keep them from sweating and feeling cool. It has a red um, silicone and a geometric cutout to make them feel kind of sexy and more breathable. And it uses anatomical suspension. Um, so through friction, it is able to contour um, or hold on to the contours of their limb. So before I end this, I want to say my main tagline for this, which is, why can't disability be sexy? And with that, I want to tell you guys a quick story of how I got this inspiration. And it was when I was out in the field and I start talking to prosthetists and these people who have been in the field for over 20 years, and I'm like this crazy designer, and I come over and I'm just like, yeah, I want to make people feel sexy. And these people, you can imagine, were laughing. And they laughed at me, and I said, you're laughing because it's funny, because when you think prosthetics, you don't think the word sexy. And so I told them, why is that funny? And, they, and I told them, that is because we have a social stigma that we do not associate people with disabilities with being sexy. And so I told them, but why can't disability be sexy? And they said, it's easier for you to be sexier, to look sexier than us, because you're a woman. We can't look sexy. Hair flip. <laughs> I was like mad, but um, I told them, no, you need to redefine what the word sexy means because being sexy isn't about how you look. Being sexy is all about how you feel. And you only feel sexy when you're confident and you're comfortable in your own skin. And that is something that people with disabilities lack and that is something that we forget. So whatever I design for them as a designer, that's what I want to do. I just want to make them feel sexy. Um, thank you. <laughs> So our first round of questions will be for Shana Garfield for her spry cane. Hi, Hi. I have a, a question. Um, I just want to know where the name came from. So spry means kind of light and um, I just wanted a product to just not like emotionally weigh you down. Um, it's a very like heavy topic um, to be disabled and self-conscious in the real world. Um, and then, uh, for actually, the cane itself uh, wanted it to be lightweight because yeah. um, it makes it easier to use. Yeah, great. Yeah. Have, you, have you used these? Have you used this prototype a, a lot? Have you gotten some, um, you know, wear and tear, are they, do you experience that they break? For my canes, they fold, um, so I end up breaking them a lot, but I imagine this one maybe not as much. 
this prototype isn't 100% working, uh, so I haven't really taken it for a spin on the subway and when the big crowds of people, um, but for um, testing the handle was like my main aspect of it and making sure that could fit for lots of different hands. Um, so that's something that I've tested extensively. Yeah. Cool, and I think you mentioned that you thought about different colors. Is there any other kind of design, like aesthetic design that um, is customizable or personalized? Or? Yes, um, if this becomes a real product, I would love to create like a community around this cane. Um, so if people uh, wanted to submit their own designs and share them with people, um, I mean, you can, you can get crazier than just colors by adding patterns and um, just really letting people to kind of make it their own. Yeah. Is it height adjustable? Yes, yeah, so the fact that it would be bought online, you'd be able to just uh, put your height in and they would tell you what size cane you need. <laughs> but this specific, like I can't, lengthen or shorten this, right? Like, right, after okay. you have it, it's one length. Um, I've, there are a lot of the canes that adjust, but it's, you're not really growing, so you don't really need to adjust the height. The folding aspect of a cane is something that I would like to explore. Um, is it, they do break, and um, they're you know, not functionally great, so I think that would be something I would like to try. And how much um, does it cost to make one? <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay. Um, Something good to know. Yeah, I, just from doing market research and other cans on the market, um, they're all kind of around like $100. I would love for it to be less expensive because another part about sex accessibility is cost, uh, but I'd have to learn more about the manufacturing, for, definitely. Cool. And what kind of metal? Uh, this is aluminum tubing, so it's super lightweight. Um, I wanted the weight to be in the handle so that it's easier to swing forward and back. Cool. Great. Our next round of questions will be for Julia for Venture. <coughs> I loved your story. The entire thing, the way that you set it up, the problem, and the way that you acknowledged immediately, like, look, this doesn't have wheels. There's a space, there's a space that I'm in. The nuances were helpful as a listener. So my question is, if you, since you are acknowledging the accessibility um, of what you've created, though aesthetically beautiful, it makes me look like it needs to be in with the Eames collection or something. Uh, <laughs> what do you envision as the ideal use case? Because you talked in the very beginning about the stigma specifically. So the sense that I got as a listener hearing you was that even in some scenarios, it might be less about physically using this device on a day-to-day -day basis, but having this device almost as an art <laughs> form to help um, society question and understand our own views of stigma. So can you share a little bit about how you feel like this could be best used in the society around us? Yes, excellent and, and difficult question. Um, I think I was coming at it from more of an art perspective as, as I guess, like a, a conversation piece. Um, I, I think that maybe outside of a gallery, it could work if um, in an office, even though you can't, I mean, I, you can kind of carry it around. It's not impossible, um, but it's, it would be, uh, if, if somebody is depending on it for mobility, it just wouldn't work. But perhaps it could sit by a desk or in a communal area and um, in that way sort of start to provoke the conversation of why does this tool have to look like a medical device? Why can't it look more like the beautiful furniture that it's surrounded by? Um, and so in that way, I think it could have a life outside of a podium, um, but I acknowledge that, that it's easier said than done. Well, you could make conversation cards. That's my feedback to you. If you're thinking about it as an art piece, really own that and mm -hmm. think about what does an art piece actually look like? And if the intent is a conversation piece, how can you build upon that? For example, mm -hmm. a deck of cards with conversation questions or something similar to help spur the conversation that you really want people to have. Thank you. Um, that's a great suggestion. Um, I also loved how it, it, 
immediately provoked thoughts for me, um, ideas of possible solutions. Oh, could we do this or that? I love the, the design that you did create. It was beautiful. Um, it's something that I would be proud to have. Um, and, you know, I was like, when you said there were no wheels, the thought was, um, what are those shoes, you know, that you can skate on? I was wondering <laughs> if you could put something similar on, build that hidden, onto the bottom. Wheels. Thank you. Great, we will move on to Chen Ni and Soft Thonet. I loved all of your research and how you went back to the original place that you went to to actually test it out. I think that's incredible. How could you see this scaling? Like I'm trying to picture it in my head as something that you might buy as a modification for different chairs. Can you walk me through what that might look like? Uh, you mean from this chair to all other kinds of chair? Yeah, or is it literal specific just for this kind of chair? So at the beginning I was exploring the the concept of having a uh, armrest that's adapted to every single chair and um, and through research and through exploration and I think you might remember there's the metal and wood that I kind of um, try experiment with. I didn't feel that's the, um, maybe, maybe it's because of even given the limit of time, I don't think it's that the right way to pursue with the armrest because what I really want to express um, is was that um, the chair uh, could be helpful for people with limited mobility, but at the same time, it should be, it needs to be aesthetic. So to, uh, having that quite, um, idea in mind, I was looking for chairs that I could already like improving on to immediately um, to make that statement. So that is why uh, led me to the Thonny chair, which I thought the original Thonny chair didn't have the armrest. It was a really good start to um, work on and then to express the thinking that all people could enjoy a really uh, beautiful piece of furniture. So that was the beginning of it. And I definitely recognize the, uh, the thinking of how could that be adapted to universal um, chairs and that was like the next uh, challenge that I'm facing. <laughs> uh, I guess my question for you is, have you considered also the comfort in terms of the material and sitting on it and, mm -hmm. you know, people who might have problems with constant pain and all that? Yes, so um, the armrest, the material for the armrest I used was a metal bar covered with foam. And that was just a part of experiment, experiment, experiment. <laughs> and um, what I was thinking to push forward was, would it be possible to have the whole chair made out of a foam, which would give support to back? And then, as you said, it, some people might uh, have some pain with longer seating. So, yeah, that that's part of the plan as well. <laughs> And our last and final set of questions are for Nicole Escobar for her sexy solution for lower limb amputation. Just want to say that I love that you used the word sexy like 20 times in your presentation. <laughs> 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 Gotta let it stick. <laughs> Thank you. Some constructive feedback. I love that too, by the way. Absolutely loved it. And love the personal anecdotes and how playful you were in the presentation that came through. And it was lovely, especially to end this amazing day <laughs> of incredible present presenters. So I noticed a couple of times you generalized and said people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I would maybe caution you to avoid generalizing mm -hmm. as much. You might be able to talk about the lived experiences of the people that you spoke with. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I 100% agree with that. I think also, um, and I'm guessing here, I'm guessing that you're not disabled, but uh, it would really strengthen your case if you know you had a collaborator, a partner who is, you know, somebody who is using this product. I am currently working on that right now with that prosthetic school that I've connected with. So thank you. That confirms it. Cool. And um, you know there. There are some, I, I know you're, you're focusing on like legs. Um, there, there are some folks that I know that are, are arm amputees um, and they're really into like cosplay and stuff like that. So that might be a good way to promote things 
Um, but yeah, I, I can maybe connect you if you're interested. Cool, we will talk after. <laughs> Okay, great. This wraps up our presentations, but I'm gonna give our panelists a chance for just final comments. If you have a general final comment, we have a lot of students in the audience, um, or any advice, and we can start with you, Wale, and work our way down. All right. Um, <laughs> I, j I guess I'll just reiterate, you know, a lot of the things that I've been saying. That, you know, there's, there's themes that I, I see, and, and um, one is to kind of think about multiple uh, ways of outputs, multimodal approaches. Um, if you are providing a solution that is visually based, to think about um, all the other mediums, sound and haptics, so that not just one small group of people can benefit from your product. Um, I would also just really highly encourage folks to be um, involved with the disability community, have people with disabilities as co-designers, um, and really a big part of the design process, um, and, and just generally also reach out to as wide of a group as possible, because if you've met one person with a disability, you've only met one person with a disability and not the whole community. Thank you. Kara? First of all, I think it needs to be said that all the projects today have been absolutely amazing and it, it's really, really great to see everybody presenting today. And I feel really strongly for telling you guys, so please, 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 don't just put this in your portfolio and put it under your bed. If you really feel passionate about these projects, please push them. And uh, you know, I, s I was in your position only a few years ago and I'm sitting here today with my product downstairs in the exhibition, so, you know, it can be achieved, and I really, really advise you to, to keep going, and they're all great, and just explore and push as much as you can. Thank you, Elise. Uh, I agree, wonderful projects. Uh, thank you so much for sharing them with us. I, um, the one thing that I would try and think about, it might not apply to every project, but can you somehow extend your design to make it something that the mainstream will use. Thank you. And Margaret? I agree with everything everyone said. You said all the things I was thinking, so I agree. Uh, and I would encourage you to think about storytelling. So it was mentioned, regardless of how you feel like this can proceed moving forward, especially for your portfolios. You know, Think about making the shortest video you can. Think about how this is represented on your site because if you, when you start to apply for jobs for internships, we really look at these things quite closely, so make sure that you monitor that. And I'll put in another plug since I did it this morning. Uh, at Microsoft Design, we have 20 more intern spots available for the summer. We pay for your housing all summer in Washington as well as many other things, so please, if you're interested in an internship, let me know. Uh, and thank you again for sharing this incredible work. Own it deeply, and thank you. So I want you to give this group a round of applause and our panelists as well. This has been an incredible opportunity for the Cooper Hewitt too, for all of us to have so many of you from different colleges and universities around the country to come here and share the groundbreaking work that's going on at universities. We hope you'll continue to stay in touch and we hope to have your objects in our collection someday. Um, if you uh, presented today and have not had your picture taken with your work, if you would please see a member of my team um, and have your picture taken. And if you're a panelist, we request that you stay for a little bit so we can do the same with you as well. Thank you everybody for attending. It was wonderful to have you all here today.